Hello, welcome to Rappler Talk. I'm Marites Vitug, and joining us today, the uh, first uh, week of January 2020, is Tanya Hamada. She's a democracy activist, and she's member of the editorial board of ILEAD, L-E-A-D, not yes. ILEAD. <laughs> I think, Tan, uh, that does uh, political analysis and economic analysis. We will be talking about the outlook for civil society groups in the Philippines in this coming year. Welcome, Tanya, to Rappler Talk. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for making time. Maybe let's take off from the recently released index, which tracks the sustainability of civil society organizations worldwide. Mm -hmm. And the findings for the Philippines are that generally we, we decline in terms of advocacy, in terms of the narrowing of civic space. space. So maybe, why is this so? And maybe you can compare or give us the context for this ranking okay. of the Philippines. So um, I trust you're talking about the CSO index. Yes. yes. So I would imagine when you talk about indices, they usually measure what you'd call the average or the the norm of, of a civil sp civic space in a country. Mm -hmm. And I think this study was done in 2018. 2018, but it covers, I think, to date around 80 countries. Yes. So yes. Uh, the the index you're talking about is for Asia in general, uh, Southeast Asia yes. and Asia. And so the one for the Philippines says we've declined, but it also says that we're the highest in the region in terms of what they uh, are measuring. So the five components would be um, advocacy, um, financial sustainability, yes. infrastructure, I think, of CSO, legal environment, and then I think what's uh, the last one. In any case, what it says about it is that even if the index shows that the Philippines still leads in terms of CSO sustainability, meaning how sustainable is a CSO in the long run in a country's space, in a country's democratic space, the Philippines is doing quite well. But I think that's not what's surprising. I think we should, we should expect that we do well. We have been called the CSO capital of the world. We have innovated so many movements and pushbacks and uh, ways to uh, express community, community protest. But what is maybe worrisome in the index is that the declines show in areas where it is an instinct of ours. So, for example, protest. Um, why, why would it decline when it's a natural instinct yes. of Filipino, organized Filipinos, uh, groups and individuals to protest? I think that that is something to look at. Another thing that you can look at in the index is the decline in terms of financial viability. Yes. There is a threat to the long-term financial sustainability of those who choose to work as organized groups. Uh, outside of government. So there, there, these are the two that I would imagine should catch your attention mm -hmm. and that should drive our discussion about what to expect for CSOs in 2020. But financial sustainability has been an issue for some time. Yes, uh, it's, yes. it's not new. But, but as you said, our instinct to protest, that's where the, the decline is, mm -hmm. can mm -hmm. be worrisome. Or, mm -hmm. So is this because of the threats mm -hmm. Definitely. Know, by, by Duterte? A apart from from the threats of the president, what factors have uh, impacted the CSOs and their uh, you know, capability to do protests? I think the capability will always be there. I think this is something that is, as I said, inherent to Philippine yes. organized groups. I think there are two factors probably. One is that, yes, there are a lot of threats. This may not be threats uh, in terms of institutional uh, to CSOs, except for, you know, there are pockets of targeted institutional CSOs. Uh, but it's both a threat on individuals, leaders that are identified with groups that would protest. So it does have a damping effect mm -hmm. on the viability of protest as an action. But also because I think um, in, the, in the history of CSOs in the Philippines, we have evolved many other areas of struggle aside from protest, mm -hmm. all nonviolent, all very creative. Uh, we've engaged government, we've done service provision, we've done, I mean, um, policy, mm -hmm. you know, we've actually yeah. in influenced policy. So there are, I would imagine that civic space in the Philippines has expanded beyond mm -hmm. protest, but, but we've always kept that, and that's why it's important for me to watch the index for that, because we've always kept that as the core 
of our identity as uh, civic civic uh, actors in democracy. Um, there was a story by I think the New Yorker which uh, described 2019 as the year of global protests. protests yes. And but yes, a lot of countries experienced mm. you know, protests. Mm. And in the Philippines, we barely had um, momentous protests or we did not really feel the impact of protests. So are, do you think, as one commented, that been there, done that, is it a failure of, of the CSOs or? No, I think, again, it's context-wise. Mm -hmm. um, I don't... I don't uh, fear that we will not protest when the need comes to protest. Mm -hmm. um, just recently, and I, I, I'm, I'm being very, what we call this, a partisan or non, non partisan mm -hmm. about the comments, meaning there are uh, movements that, that come out and protest. For example, Angkas. Mm -hmm. That was a yes, pushback yes. Uh, when needed. You have um, the dance craze that happened yes. last December the, of by the South Sarah Hieronimo that started as a protest of volleyball uh, players who were not allowed to play in front of the store of Aling Nelia. <laughs> so they decided to protest with, with the song. So it's, it's in our blood, but I think you're right. We did not have a national massive organized protest because I think it's not yet there. We're not yet there. Um, but if the push will come, I mean, if, if the push and the closing of civic space happens, they will, it's natural, they will push people towards that area. It, it's inevitable. In, inevitable. Um, another thing probably to comment on is that we've had, I mean, historically, we've had several massive yes. successful protests. So it's yes. not a failure. In fact, I would probably credit the stable and high scores of the CSO Sustainability Index to the, the historical fact that it has been now ingrained into our DNA that civic space is essential for democratic space in the Philippines. So I think that right now, we, that, that muscle hasn't been exercised yet. I am quite confident that that muscle is there. I am not quite confident that we are as organized or that yeah. we can organize in the usual way uh, for it to be exercised again. So all of yeah. those are you know, things that we can watch for in 2020. So uh, actually, uh, we're not looking at traditional movements mm -hmm. anymore. Yes, and we have to be more innovative. But you were earlier, uh, Tanya, you talked about, before the interview, you talked about factors or mm. your what are what sh factors will impact the CSOs for 2020, or mm. how do you think this will shape up in this year, mm. the, the CSOs and the protest movement? Mm. We can we can start with the, where we left off. Um, the the conditions are probably not yet ripe yeah. because I think this is a time where mga CSO eh, kailangan natin bumalik sa komunidad. We have to go back mm. to the community. We have to relearn that DNA and recalibrate. What does it mean to be the organized groups for the community? Our communities are evolving. They are no longer only geographic based. We have social media. They're not only issue based. We have um, what you call it, um, uh, marginalized, new mm -hmm. types of marginalized groups, economically marginalized groups. So communities are evolving. I think one of the biggest themes that NGOs will have to recalibrate and work on sa 2020 is mag, mag, uh, balik tayo, balik tayo sa komunidad, balik tayo sa kung saan pinanggalingan ang pag-organisa. That's where I think, that's one big, big theme. At umalis ba ang mga um, so activists? I mean, they for, they've forgotten the True. communities? Activists have never left. Mm -hmm. Organized civil society has evolved over time because, siempre as CSO, hindi ka lang taga organisa ng ng community. Mm -hmm. Kailangan din magpalakas ka na institution, become fiducia, financially viable, mm -hmm. become organized, mm -hmm. become articulate, become engage the processes of government. I mean, it's it's a it's a big yeah. ask, especially in the Philippines. Na sa tingin ko ang mga CSOs normally take up the space when institutions are weak. So service delivery, articulation of policy, advocacy, lobbying. I mean, pag mahina ang gobyerno at hindi niya napapakinggan ang mga tao, 
the CSO step in mm -hmm. to try to bridge and, and that work needs a lot of organization and uh, capability building. But it needs to again strengthen the core where it came from, which is yung, but ka ba nag in the first place? Diba? Meron kang pinag uh, lalaban. It's for something for yes. the community and these communities are changing. So it's that space where we will evolve in 2020. There are a lot of new exciting communities, um, LGBT, climate change, the indigenous people's movements will definitely have to come back in 2020 because of all of the threats to indigenous mm. people's uh, ancestral domains. Um, economic, you know, as the demographics of the Philippines change, yung we have, we're moving out of poverty, but we have a lot of vulnerable poor. Yeah. Yung isang bagyo lang, balik sila yeah. ulit sa poverty. Yeah. That's a community. So you have to speak for them. You have to organize. You have to relearn the ability to be the bridge uh, for those articulations. So yun yung isa, communities, that's the first. I can go on with the five, but yes. any question? Yeah, <laughs> maybe I was thinking, pero may fear factor, di ba? That's true, that's Even true. if you go to the communities, hindi ba na nakakatakot din kasi we have a very authorita authoritarian presence with a very Correct. strong streak of, you know, Correct. talagang mag-i-issue siya ng threats. Correct. So, how do you fight the fear in the communities? Yun nga yung ano eh, um, I won't have the answer. I think, sa totoo lang, feeling ko yung sagot nasa communities eh. Mm. But that's why we have to go back there eh. Um, somebody told me, a wise person told me once that um, democracy is built on hope and authoritarianism is built on anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you want mm. to seed hope, you have to you know, start to rebuild the institutions of democracy yes. and vice versa. Okay. To build democracy, you have to start seeding hope. So, feeling ko, ta pero tamang sabi mo, eh, it, it, the fear is real such that I think you know, the second of my things to watch for in the year is that the vanguards and the individuals will bear the brunt. Parang ako, I'm, I, I'm fearful for that, but I'm also um, committed, I guess, to know that we have to help. We have to support those who will be the vanguards and those and the, then and the individual activists who will actually, you know, start yes. the spark yes. spark. And they have. It has been continuous. Yeah. They have our news is filled with, you know, all of these individuals who despite all of this push push from the government keep, you know, being the vanguards mm -hmm. of keeping holding the line as you call it or pushing for change. Um, I think we have to be very, very cognizant in 2020 na tulungan natin sila. Kilalanin natin sila, alamin natin what they're doing because that's the second uh, thing that will affect our space. So, uh, one point lang there is, dyan tayo kakaiba sa Hong Kong. Mm. Kasi in Hong Kong deliberate mm. sila na leaderless. Mm. Correct. So it, in a way, it has posed a problem kasi if the government wants to speak that's true. to the movement, that's true. who are the leaders that they that's need true. to speak with? So it's an Meron ding palang disadvantage kung leaderless. kung leaderless. So dito naman sa Philippines, as you said, identified na. Makikita. Whether kung sila talaga ang leaders <laughs> or not, basta identified na sila. Yeah, oh, okay. So ano yung third na sabi mo, the, the, uh, these individuals will bear will, the brand? Will okay. build the brand. Ano yung I third think the third format? is linked to that again. So these are all linked actually. Mm. Um, I think the biggest battle will be the battle for truth. Um, whether organized civil society, movements, grassroots uh, organizations, um, individuals will bear the brunt. I think one of the biggest ammunitions or defense that people will have is the truth. Um, again, I don't have the answer. I do know that so many groups are concerned mm -hmm. with how do you battle disinformation, how do you make the playing field equal in the battle of ideas, mm -hmm. diba? Feeling ko naman kung tanungin mo, ayaw naman nila ng diktadora eh. Ayaw naman nila ng strongman rule eh. Ang gusto nila, mapayapa, uh, maginhawa, nabuhay, may oportunidad for everybody. But the truth of how you get there and the truth of what the government is doing has to be available. Uh, the truth of all of the um, accusations against you know civil society organizations or the closing of civic space or the monopoly of uh, what narratives but that is not going to help civic space in 2020 so i think the biggest fight will be for it's the battle for truth in so, 2020 so dapat ang civil society groups 
should really be very active in fighting this information. Dapat din, as one NGO leader told me, dapat may positive trolling ang CSOs. <laughs> ah, okay, may positive Pwede trolling. <laughs> Kasi you use now the techniques of That's the trolls, but without uh, saying lies, without the fake news. But very immediate ang response at saka focus ang messaging. So that's anyway, true. that's a thought lang for CSO. Whether online, <laughs> pero totoo naman eh, whether online or offline, ako eh, the, the chismis network. I mean, <laughs> pero dapat yung chismis is truth. Diba yung, we, we share stories. We are very story, uh, uh, kwento ng katotohanan. I mean, is something that matters to the communities that you work with. So, as you said, yeah, targeted, uh, relevant, but truth. I agree. And of course, social media is one mm. battlefield. It's so, also one committee. I've always yeah, wondered really? whether social media is a tool or a community. If it's a community, then there. That's another area that has to be looked at by mm. organized groups. Okay, so what's the <laughs> next forecast for 2020? Um, ako yon. Um, I think for the past three years, people, a lot of people have commented, whether locally or through international circles of uh, civic space, that how come the Philippine civil society is quiet? Mm -hmm. You know, wh why, why don't we hear things from the Philippines? Yeah. I think we're, let's see how this plays out. Are there still arenas for engagement? Are there still areas for long-term reform to be worked on? I think there was some kind of a mode of looking at what we can do. But then, at the end of the year, you start to feel, last year, I saw some headlines that, okay, now the SEC is to their advantage, mm -hmm. those who want to close civil, civic space. It will hamper a lot of civil society organizations. But um, the other side of me also feels that uh, there, there is space for the financial uh, sustainability of CSOs to grow in terms of its capability then now to become more you know, responsible uh, financial actors in terms of reform. But if it starts to impede in terms of the purpose, the goals, the orientation of civil society in general, then I think that that is not going to be good. And if that push happens, I will predict happily, I hope, <laughs> that there will be pushback from, yeah. from the civil society, yeah. the organized civil society groups. Because uh, a number of civil society groups receive foreign funding yeah. from, let's say, for example, the EU, mm -hmm. now which our president loves to hate, mm -hmm. or uh, countries that supported uh, Iceland in the resolution to investigate human rights. So that's an issue where you think there will maybe push back in 2020? Possibly. Yeah. I've always looked at foreign funding as a non-issue. Mm. I don't know why the government does because the government is also foreign funded in terms yes, of you know, grants. And we, we have a lot of bilateral agreements. Yeah. I mean, if they say that it, it, it affects policy, that's just like saying that foreign funding to NGO. I mean, it's a non-issue for me. What's, what the issue is, is whether or not um, these CSOs um, you know, are legitimately uh, registered, you know, declare their principles, their board, their, you know, the responsible side of being a organized organization. Otherwise, regardless where you get your funding, as long as you're transparent, accountable, yeah. and, and uh, open, then, then it's, it's a non-issue for me. I think it's a, it's a very divisive issue that the government tries to bring in when you just, just to say that just because you're foreign funded as an NGO, that means that you're anti-Philippine. Yes. Um, I and know many Philippine NGOs who are anti-Philippine. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't yeah. make sense. So, yeah. But that's one, that's probably one area that can be clarified. And, yeah. Yeah. So you were on your third or fourth yeah. forecast? Fourth. Um, yes, that's the push hard and there will be push back. Yes. And so the last, I think I, want, I wanted to end on a bit of not really, end, but you know, uh, do the five with a bit of optimistic things. I still think that the Philippines is a bellwether. It has always been a bellwether, whether for good or for bad. Um, for example, the use of social media as a as a space for disinformation was, you know, piloted in the Philippines. But at the same time, people power grew out of the mm. Philippines. So I think the innovations in 2020 will still come from Philippine civic space. I think, I really I really believe that there will be innovations that come from civic space. Um, I like it when I see small 
strong stories about individuals or organizations engaging civic space as compared to let's say uh, civil society indices indices mm. are are general you know they're good to look at for the long-term democratic fight for civic space but when you want to see where are we who are we what are we doing look for the small stories for example um, the lone protester who came out uh, against the burial of, of Marcos, Marcos. Yeah. yes that to me that was a that was an important point that we shouldn't have missed, meaning there is a narrative there that people are willing to fight for. The second one is probably the dance protest mm -hmm. that happened and it went viral. You know, every time an activist steps forward, he or she or it, if it's a group, can't help themselves because, you know, there is crisis and they, 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 they do something, they take an action. Now, whether or not people respond or resist that action mm -hmm. is what determines whether it becomes a movement or you remain in the status quo. And I think it's in our DNA, again, as, as a country. For the there are so many innovations that are happening. And so I think um, if and when there will be a time that something, someone stands up, and there will always be people who stand up, um, when people resonate with that, the innovations mm -hmm. for civic pushback will come from the Philippines. There's one interesting thing that also maybe we should include in our mm -hmm. scanning for 2020 is that Will will business uh, join the push pushback? Ah, <laughs> of course, they're, they're always the last. True, true. Remember in the uh, 80s. I'm just curious because of what's happening now. The true. two big water concessionaires are being threatened true. despite their win in the arbitration. Yet they've been so meek true. and they've even apologized. Et but anyway, it's just there. Do you think there will be a yeah, yeah. can um, they be part of this advocacy movement? There is, of a, law, you know? <laughs> there is a narrative going on among the more progressive mm -hmm. business groups globally. So, because I also sit on the World Movement uh, mm -hmm. for Democracy Steering Committee. And so one of the areas that is of interest to the World Movement is what is the role of the private sector. Mm -hmm. And there are narratives in the private sector which now have shifted what they call the bottom line. Even private sector groups now, there is a article which um, I should forward to you that says that they've shifted their bottom line. They've defined their bottom line now as the community. Mm -hmm. So they're going back to the, uh, their consumers, the, con the community as the consumer rather than just profit, blind profit. So because they see, they see the, the polarization of their consumer base. They see the non-sustainability of having a very tight uh, and small consumer base. It's not inclusive. So even private sector is feeling that shift globally. Probably locally, we don't have yet the environment where business can actually proactively take a stand. We, ha we are a very captured uh, political environment. The small um, local uh, business groups who have now shifted their CSR, uh, social responsibility, f away from just service provision to actually start to talk about long-term democratic um, ideas, dialogues, discussions, uh, policies. So I think there is a possibility. It's a very yes, it's, uh, At least but there's something to look forward to. In I 20 am a you're, you're a DHO, <laughs> a diehard optimist. optimist. That's true. So, mm -hmm. and to our viewers and listeners, we will continue, the, especially in the civil society sector. We will be able from the community.